Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm so sorry about that. Um, Nurhan is having some technical difficulties, so uh, she has get handed me over the baton, and I will be moderating until she's hopefully able to join. Um, but until then, uh, we're really excited to have everybody here, have all the participants here, and have these really awesome panelists here with us today. Um, so my name is Farah, and I'm the co-founder, along with Nurhan Shaban of Cust Impact. And um, we're all really excited for this panel today. Um, I'd like to thank the conference organizers as well as our audience. Um, we have a lot of people here watching from so many different countries and time zones, uh, including my family in California and Nurhan's family in Egypt. So thank you all for being here. Um, in terms of structure, we have just under one hour. Um, if the audience has any questions, we'll leave about five or 10 minutes at the end. So feel free to type in your questions in the chat box and we can, um, we can address them when we get to them. So we have a diverse panel of, of women here today. Um, I'm gonna be uh, doing both moderation and, and being a panelist. So bear with me here. Um, and uh, I can start with having each uh, panelist briefly introduce yourselves. If you can take about 30 seconds, um, just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do, um, that would be great. So if, uh, Asil, if we can start with you, that would be great. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here as well and to get to know the panelists. Um, so uh, my name is Asil Halabi. I'm co-founder and COO at Bloomer Tech. And it's a company that's retrofitted an everyday bra to be a medical device for women with heart disease. So really my background is in design and I was in a totally different industry, real estate but through some personal experiences, I decided like this is what I wanted to dedicate my life to. Um, so here I am today. That's amazing. I can't wait to hear more about that. Um, Amelie, can you go next? Hi, I'm Emily Ansour. It's so nice to, to be with you. Um, I work for the World Food Program and they are the largest organization, humanitarian organization in the world working to address food insecurity and hunger in all its forms. I work for WFP Jordan, so I work specifically on how we can support uh, vulnerable Jordanian populations and refugee populations to address their, to help them achieve food security and promote self-reliance. And I do this through innovation, so through working with startups locally. That's incredible. Um, and you got locked down in Jordan two weeks after you arrived, right? <laughs> we feel for you. Um, Ronit, can you go next? Sure. So hi, everyone. I'm Ronit Avni, and I'm the founder and CEO of Localized, which is a talent tech company that connects university students and recent graduates in emerging markets to industry experts to guide them and employers to hire them. And we tap into diaspora networks um, to channel their knowledge to the communities they care about. Thank you, Ronit. Um, awesome story, as always. Um, and we lost you for a second, uh, if, you, if you can hear us. Um, but I can also introduce myself. My name is Farah Harakat, and I am a product manager at Hala Systems, as well as the co-founder of Cusp Impact. Um, prior to joining Hala Systems, I served on Airbnb's humanitarian team, which works to house refugees and disaster evacuees using Airbnb. And before that, I worked in international development in the US government. So I've had a pretty diverse career path myself, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the panel as well. Um, so, Amelie, if we can start with you, I have, we have a couple of questions for you. Um, you're an innovation consultant at the World Food Program. Can you tell us a little bit more about your work? And this is a panel on impact and tech, um, so it's good to define what we mean. So can you tell us about your work and also define social impact in your own terms? Globally, there's over 820 million people that face food insecurity. Uh, Jordan alone, WFP supports over 1 million people. So food insecurity in many forms is a, a terrible issue that's that's not going away and it's been growing in the, the last few decades. So um, the traditional approaches that have been taken to address it are not alone. So I work with a team that looks at innovative ways of solving food insecurity, whether it's from an agri-tech perspective and producing more food or distribution of food or making it more nutritious in some way. Uh, we look at all of the different forms and work with local innovators. So this is a specific component of my work in Jordan, which is to work with the local ecosystem and uh, support locally built solutions to help them design, um, build, and scale their, their innovations. 
Um, and I think the term social impact, which you've you've asked what what I think it means, um, I think that it's been fairly diluted in a lot of ways when we talk about what is a social impact startup or what is a social impact project. I think that there's been kind of a category that social impact startups are put in and then there's all the rest. And I think that that um, does a disservice to innovation and to communities that can have impact and people that can have impact because we always have impact in anything we do, whether it's people or as organizations or as startups, you're never doing anything so lightly as to not impact. We're talking about a social issue or an economic one or an environmental one, you are leaving an impact. And so the question is therefore, what is the impact you're having and not whether you are a positive social impact startup. So I think we should broaden the conversation a little bit and look at it more as a continuum and realize that not, you know, not one startup has does only good and not one startup does only bad. Um, but instead look at it more as an evolving state um, because I think that every startup and every innovation has potential to be a social impact startup if we broaden those terms. And to, to make it a little bit more tangible, I work with a lot of supply chain startups and I don't mm -hmm. think that they were born out of a um, many of them were not born out of a desire to correct a social ill, but actually yeah. a lot of food issues are a result of supply chain issues. And so therefore, if you can solve some supply chain issues, you can eliminate food waste, you can uh, and you can uh, reduce food prices, et cetera. You can have a positive net impact on people's lives. So I think let's um, broaden the conversation, broaden the term a little bit and and realize that we all make an impact. And it's a question of, of what is that impact? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, to follow up on that, when you work with these startups, how do you bring that that term, you know, however you define it, um, how do you bring that into the conversation when you're working with these supply chain startups, for example? Um, what are some best practices that we can use strategy with companies like the ones you're mentioning or startups like the ones you're mentioning that where it might not be top of mind for them? Yeah, I think um, one is to really know the problem, know the root causes. So we are very, we operate um, as the World Food Program, we operate very closely to these issues. And so as experts in these areas, it's up to us to help convey that, um, that the challenges and to help um, build awareness around these issues. Because to be frank, not many people know how food systems work. They don't know whether you're an innovation or not, your startup or not. Um, it's not always apparent what are the issues. So I think one of the roles of people that are in my position, whether they're um, working with startups and helping them to devise their social impact strategy is to look at really what's the root cause and help to then design a solution that actually addresses the problem and to not try to create, um, to not do it the other way around where you're just trying to fit your startup into a problem you really need to get proximate you need to understand the problem you need to be very close to it so um, we work my, through my work um, i work very closely with startups to make sure that they're first of all understanding the problem in all of its forms and then deciding later whether they're the correct uh, innovation to solve that perfect thank you for sharing that and welcome nurhan and welcome back ronit we're happy to have you both thank here you. <laughs> um, thank you so much Farah. yeah no problem yeah. Um, so, since Nurhan is here, maybe you can take 30 seconds to introduce yourself as well, um, now that all of the other panelists have introduced themselves. Uh, sure. Um, hi everyone, my name is Nurhan. I, usually I don't experience that much technical <laughs> difficulty, but I'm sorry for it. I am uh, the co-founder of Cost Impact with Farah, and I'm really excited to be here with these like incredible panel of women. Sorry, I com my computer hasn't been working for the past 10 minutes, so I don't even know what question you're on. <laughs> No worries. Um, we just talked to uh, to Emily about her experiences. Um, and so I guess next, I, I'd love to ask Ronit a question. Um, mm -hmm. Ronit founded your awesome company, Localized, three years ago. Um, and I'm honored to be an, on the advisory council of Localized. Um, and this addresses such a huge problem, brain drain. Um, so we have two questions for you. First, can you tell us more about what Localized does? Um, and second, what surprised you about your journey this far? Sure, so what Localize does is we help students, university students and recent graduates who wanna enter the global economy, who wanna do meaningful work and work that has a lot of growth potential to connect to people who can guide them no matter what their resources are, no matter what language they speak or where they live. Um, the idea actually started out of work that I had done in Palestine a number of years ago. And so if you have communities that have connectivity but not necessarily mobility, it's challenging. And 
and um, uh, and yet there are all these professionals globally who share roots who want to give back and help the next generation of young people. And so what Localize does is we partner with universities and organizations. Primarily, we started in the Middle East and North Africa, although we are, we've now expanded to India and beyond. And the university students join, and there are experts like yourself, Farah, and like others, who share their insights about tech and data-enabled sectors, so that if you want to go into fintech or edtech or medtech or AI, you're learning from the best all over the world who are sharing those insights the way alums would normally do, uh, share that expertise with their alma mater. And then recently, we introduced employers who are looking to hire, and so the idea is experts to guide the students and employers to hire them. And it's meant to be an ecosystem so that no matter where you live, you can actually participate in the global economy and, and have an exciting future. That's wonderful. And Ramit, if you, if you would not like, it's been three years since you started this journey. What, are, what have been some of the things that surprised you about this journey so far? Some of the learnings that you, know, you wouldn't have imagined? Sure. So I think it's always, it takes longer than you think, it's harder than you think. Uh, I think I knew that going in, but relearning that is, is always humbling. Uh, for me, it was also interesting to just say, where are the women? Um, I had come from a sector, I had worked in the media sector, I'd worked in documentary film, I'd worked in the nonprofit space, where there are tons of women and there's tons of funding for women. And um, coming into the tech space, the platform space, that was very jarring. Um, and in fact, there's more investment in women entrepreneurs in places like MENA than there are in North America. So there's a lot of work, and that's true you know, globally, that that representation needs to be addressed. Um, I think the other piece is that um, it's so important to just keep a beginner's mindset that you can't be attached. I would say um, I came from the film industry and there are a lot more similarities between film and tech entrepreneurship than I would have expected. I think one of the key pieces is that you can't be attached to anything because you might have you know, the greatest idea in the world, but um, if it doesn't pan out in a good film or if, if your users don't enjoy a particular experience, you have to be super nimble and to, um, and to just adapt. So I would say those similarities and the demographics of it uh, took an adjustment for me. I guess, thank you so much, Ramit. I think my next question is for you, Farah. Um, you started out, you studied design, you started out in the government, and then you transitioned into the tech space. You've been building products and doing a lot of UX. When you're designing in, let's say, Airbnb in Silicon Valley, how do you design for a global audience? How do you, how can you be inclusive when you're designing from California? Yeah, sure. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, I always knew that I wanted to do something in the development space and work um, with people in need and design for people in need. So I went to Berkeley and then I went to the Harvard Design School where I received training in inclusive and participatory research. Um, and then I, I did what I thought was the right decision, which was I went into the US government um, to do international development specifically. And it was, it was great at the time, but I also found it to be a lot of, you know, sitting at this big table and, you know, signing a really big check and then not having anything to do with the people who are receiving that check. Um, and so that was kind of uh, a wake up call for me. And I uh, decided to transition into tech where I ended up on Airbnb's social impact team. And then later at Hala Systems, which is a social enterprise also working with people in need. Um, and my tech experience has been really great. And I found that there are awesome startups like, like Ronit with Localize, like Hala Systems and Airbnb that are working in this space, but there's also a lot of room for improvement. And um, sometimes people coming from a very well-intentioned space are building for people who are actually just like them. And if you've lived in Silicon Valley your whole life and you have never really gone anywhere else or worked outside of the tech space, this can lead to gaps in understanding. Um, that's why I believe it's really important to work with your users on the ground and also build teams that come from those users as well. Um, so again, I, I keep using Ronit as an example here, but Ronit is, is building for the diaspora community in the Middle East. And you know she has a lot of team members who are from the Middle East. Um, and I think that that's, that's really incredible. So I can also give an example about, um, about working at Airbnb um, and our work connecting refugees to temporary housing. While I was there, uh, we wanted to utilize Airbnb's platform to do what it does best, which is connect hosts and guests. But we would remove that price, the, the price tag and the price tag became $0 for people in need. And we thought this would be exactly the same as you know, the normal Airbnb that you and I see, but we found that when we actually spoke to users on the ground and we removed the exchange of money from the site, people started to see simple questions as requirements. 
So for example, when we would ask host standard questions like, what amenities are available? Do you offer towels, shampoo, parking, etc.? These are standard questions that every host receives. But we found that in this specific use case, hosts took it to be a requirement rather than a question. So they thought that since they were volunteering their space to host, that they had to provide everything that we asked of them to. So the takeaway here is that it's really important that you talk to everyone. In this case, we needed to talk to the beneficiaries, the people in need, but we also had to talk to the hosts who would be serving them and collaborating with them. And this caused us to completely change the way we used our language on the site and to clarify our content so that features would be uh, more readily clear and available to, to encourage hosts to sign up for free. That's wonderful. And I, you're absolutely right. The distinction between designing for people versus designing with people is really key. So I guess if someone comes to you today and says, hey, I'm starting my own company. I'm very, I mean, I have the best intentions in mind, but I need like, what should I do to make sure that I'm being inclusive? Like what would be the do this, this and that? Yeah, that's that's great. Um, it's it's great to be well intentioned, um, and I think one way to to cover your bases and make sure that you're you're doing the right work is to first and foremost make exactly zero assumptions. Don't think that you know anything about your user because you really don't. You don't know anything about your user until you're on the ground with them, and even then, you can miss a lot of important points if you don't ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. So it's important to understand your user's language, their culture, their life experiences. Some of your users may not know how to read or write. Um, they may not have constant access to the internet the way so many of us are addicted to. Um, they may not. They may be users in a conflict zone where something that looks simple to you and I could be a cause for suspicion if others were to see it on their phones. Um, so these are all things that may not occur to you and they definitely wouldn't occur to me um, unless you're on the ground with your users. And I think to take it in even a step further is beyond even going to the users, you have to check who's on your team. Who are you hiring? Um, if everyone on your product or UX team comes from the same place, looks the same, has the same experiences, you're setting yourself up for bias. Um, so again, some companies uh, try to mitigate this by having a fixer, right? So that's somebody that they have on the ground. And when they go conduct research on the ground, that person like sets them up with the right people and makes sure that they are speaking to the right people. And that's a good step in the right direction. But what's even more important and what's critical is to make sure that you hire full-time staff on your team who come from these backgrounds across all levels of leadership. Um, and anything less than that, I think, is going to set you up for, for issues down the line. And last, last, last point is talk to everyone. Talk to everyone about everything. Show them your product prototypes, but then even beyond that, take the time to understand who they are as a person. What do they do for a living? What do they do for fun? What bus route do they take for work? Um, these are all things that give you a better picture and a more holistic picture of who your user is and can lead to a lot of huge surprises. You might find that you're, what you're building isn't even the right thing and that there's actually a, a much bigger, different problem that you need to solve for. And you won't know unless you like get on the bus with them, basically. Great. These are great advice. Thank you so much, Farah. Mm -hmm. I guess my next question is for you, Asil. You, know, you co-founded Bloomer Tech in 2017. I'd love, can you tell us more about how this journey has been for you? And what are some key learnings and surprises you've you know, you experienced along the way? Yeah, sure. So, um, so again, my background is industrial design. So I definitely tackle every situation with that mindset as in like exactly how Farah was describing, right? Users, 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 or, or like your people at the end of the day. Um, and with, with, after those personal experiences where I found that a lot of the women in my family had to go through these painful diagnostic processes to understand their heart ailments, I realized, oh, this wasn't specific to my family. It was actually like a lot of women had these really scary stories with how long it took to receive a diagnosis, how much they experimented with drugs, and how long it took before they settled on, you know, a normal lifestyle again, uh, if they were lucky to settle on that. Um, and so my first surprise really, I was at MIT at the time where I met kind of my co-founder and our first surprise in kind of just researching this topic was when we tell people we're very interested in women's health and understanding more this under-researched subject, a lot of people were like, oh, do you mean fertility or do you mean breast cancer? Like women's health was one of two things and it, to a large degree, it still is talked about that way. And yet today's number one killer is heart disease and one in three women suffer from heart disease. So it's more common than we think. 
And some of, so that was my first surprise. Like it's not talked about enough, even though it's a huge problem. Um, and then the second thing was obviously that, that understanding where this bias comes from. So like the history of the bias, whether it's algorithmic or data or representation bias, kind of all these areas. Um, so yeah, I, I think what Farah described, yeah, you're exactly right. This is the fun part of building a startup or a company, right? Like going to the users, talking to them, like empowering yourself with the people that have a burning need uh, that you can help solve. So I think that to me is one of the most important things in social impact, to have this kind of tie to the users, this con con continuous tie that helps you weather the storms that you will see in building a company, right? Like the lows and sometimes all the no's you hear and like they're the people that keep you going, the drive you have. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that in, in my journey, we've gotten to a place where we have good relationships with, with the users that we want to build for on all set sides, right? You need the payer side, you need the, the user side, and they might not be the same person. And then the other stakeholders that are influencing the decision-making process, it gets very complicated the farther along you get, right? So in talking to all of them, having a good relationship just helped us weather things like COVID, like keep us steady, keep us kind of always tied to the ground. Yeah. That's, uh, can someone, am I, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. great. Um, thank you so much, Asil. And thank you all for sharing your experience so far. I think I'd like to shift gears a little bit. And since COVID is happening and everyone's talking about how COVID is disrupting individuals, companies, industries. Um, I'd be so curious, and that's a question for all of you. If we're having this conversation in five or 10 years from now, what might be different? And also what maybe should be different? Um, and maybe we can start with, you know, in the same order we started, Amali, Runit, Farah, and Nasi. Yeah, I think um, in general, I think we're getting back to basics. And I think a lot, I mean, if you even think of what you spent money on in the, in the lockdown, probably essential essential needs. Um, and I think coming from a lens of food security, I think a lot of countries now and, and, or, and companies are starting to think really critically about their food supplies, distribution, um, what would happen if every border shut down, which is, I mean, in a lot of cases we did, what would happen if supply chains were completely disrupted. So I think that there will be a return to um, uh, looking at food production and distribution uh, because that's a, an essential Part of life and a lot of countries re, uh, witnessed a price shock or shortages in some cases and we're still dealing with the effects of that so i expect that there will be a rise in agritech that there will be a rise in supply chains um, that there will be a shift to digitization of supply chains that there's a focus more of a focus on decentralization and having local production and not outsourcing things as much of course there's nuances within this but i think in general you're starting to see these questions come up um, in terms of what should change, I think that um, uh, in terms of security of workers and secure health concerns and traceability of um, uh, when it comes to producing food, for example, and being able to trace back if there was an outbreak in a distribution center, how can a company go about um, remedying that outbreak? So there's going to be a shift into evaluation, into um, digital solutions, perhaps, um, and a more focus on on evaluating like, the impact of future pandemics. Um, yeah, I think that that I'll, I'll end there and look at other speakers. Thank you, Molly. Runit, do you want to? Sure. To so I, I think you know we're we're working in an area where it had already been trending towards things like digitalization um we're working in the ed education space and also the talent tech or recruitment space i think the issue of brain drain is going to be radically reimagined over the coming years because it used to be this idea that if you were in a particular geography and you left it your knowledge was gone 
but we're moving into an era where remote work is going to become more and more acceptable. I can't tell you how rapidly very um, old institutions, very conservative institutions that we've worked with dramatically shifted online and are now talking about the fact that even after COVID, 50% of their workforce is going to remain remote indefinitely. And so we've accelerated the pace of remote work by a decade, I would say, particularly in higher education and in the employment space. Um, so, I, so this notion of brain drain is gonna shift because if your knowledge can be transferred from anywhere, if you can be working from anywhere, then brain circulation gets accelerated. And, and that was, at Localize, that was our hope anyhow. Our, our feeling was that if you could get that knowledge to the communities that need it, that would be incredibly beneficial. But I think now the world has moved in that direction, you know, not just in, because of these circumstances. So I see a reimagining of that. Um, a couple of other spaces where I think there's going to be a lot of change. Certainly, elder care is going to is going to change a lot how we think about uh, uh, those that are aging, um, and also early childhood. I think we're we're becoming aware of the constraints of technology. Where is it applicable? Places like higher education, upskilling, knowledge sharing, workforces that you can be very efficient. You can have intimacy and connection and forge relationships virtually. But for very young children, I think we're also gonna see a move away from screens uh, and a little more humility in the early childhood ed tech space about what requires uh, human interaction. Great, and you mentioned the care, um, the shifting perceptions around care and the elderly. Can you speak, can you elaborate? What do you mean by that? I think that, uh, at least for me, so my, my mother is in Montreal, as an example, and I can't go, I'm in the United States right now, and I can't go see her. And I, I'm um, thankful every day that she's not in a home for the elderly at the moment, locus of outbreaks. And so even if we have a vaccine for, for coronavirus, even if we get to the point in a year and a half, two years, where that situation is stabilized, I think many of us have been quite scarred by the idea of people aging alone, dying alone, not having access uh, to to their families. Uh, I grew up with my grandparents living right upstairs from me in Montreal, and I've been craving the elders. Uh, and I think that I'm not alone in feeling like I want I want to be near those that are aging. I don't ever want a situation where a parent or an uncle or aunt is alone, where no one has access to them. So I think we already there's been a movement to think about um, uh, intentional communities for aging and how people live. I think that I think houses is going to change in terms of having studio space and remote workspace where you have rooms designated. So lots of these small. Um, there are going to be these uh, changes, I think, that are going to enable us to be closer to the people that we might need to care for, um, and also to enable us to be more flexible as we move forward. But again, I'm, I'm not a futurist, but <laughs> those are some of my, my, my instincts on it. Thank you for sharing these thoughts. And I, I mean, as someone who, as my parents are in Egypt, I, understand, I, I personally relate to this, but I was very curious what you meant. Farah, what do you think? Yeah, I totally agree with Amelie and Ronit. Um, and I think that there's a silver lining here. You know, I think that uh, coronavirus is very scary and everything's uncertain right now, but it's also breaking down the barriers to remote work. Um, and it's making it a lot easier for people to, to do things like hop into this conference. You know, this is, this, this is happening completely virtually and we have people tuned in from all over the world. And we have, um, I think, I think that the need to be in a major super expensive city is diminishing. And I think we're gonna see cities change a lot because of that. Um, and I think we're gonna see the, the interaction of the global South with the global North changing a lot too, because now all of this talent in the global South, which was restricted in so many ways in the past, hopefully will now be able to make its way into the global North and, and to be able to also generate uh, companies and generate talent and, and, and opportunities from the global South as well. Um, so I see it in a lot of ways. I'm I'm very optimistic that it's hopefully helping to level the playing field in a lot of ways. Thank you, Asil. Yeah, um, I want to definitely echo something Emily you said that basically decentralization for the healthcare industry at least it's definitely um, hospitals have to rethink their whole business model, the whole how you develop a hospital, like is there the same need for this type of facility management, et cetera. And at least with our product at Bloomer Tech, we, we have 
taken on COVID as an opportunity for a strategy shift. Like we wanna, we wanna participate in the acceleration of personalized health. Like each person has their lifestyle. Each person should be treated differently depending on who they are, their genes, their environment. Um, and so this is a great way to do this, right? Like uh, now everyone's thinking of it and it's and it has to be remote care. People aren't aren't going to the hospital anymore. They're too scared. Um, so I think uh, the bigger picture is that with decentralization of care, who's going to be that? Is it a clinic? Who, who are you going to next that's going to control the healthcare process? And that's what kind of scares me. I don't want to be a skeptic in this like very optimistic group, which is very awesome. But as much as we wanna say that we're leveling the playing field and everyone now is able to participate on a global level that they weren't able to do so before, uh, the, the big players are still the same. And it's very hard to kind of reroute given the resource, the resource allocation and kind of the gaps in, in equity. So yeah, that's uh, honestly, I'm very curious to see how this unfolds. I think it's very exciting that even amidst COVID, there are still revolutions happening. People are still fighting to get their voice heard, uh, still trying to fight to change how things are done in any industry, right? Um, but yeah, how, how we kind of follow through on that implementation is gonna be very important. At, at least at Bloomer Tech, we're very adamant on saying that women need to participate in health, as in when they develop the vaccines for COVID, women need to be there, right? Like we need to make sure beforehand that vaccines are being tested on women and not find out that vaccines have an adverse effect on women and not on men like there's so so yeah as much as we want this vaccine to come out right away we need to do it right and i hope this kind of translates to every sector and everything that we're doing in this new world <laughs> if you will thank you Lucille. Uh, i guess my next question is it touches upon some of the things already mentioned like farah you talked about being inclusive of users Ronit, you talked about having more and seeing more women um a lot of people are, I, I hope, are hoping to like sponsor, mentor, include people who are, who come from different backgrounds, who don't look like they do. I'd love to hear from all of you about like specific strategies that if I am looking to mentor people, how can I become someone who's inclusive, even in who I choose to mentor and sponsor? Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what have you seen that other people do that's successful? What is not successful? And what do you personally do? And maybe you can start with the other way around. Sure. I mean, I don't, I always like to help women in any situation. I think that's my, um, if you want, the legacy I want to leave that I've been able to I, I impact women the way my family and supporters have let, helped me get to the path I'm on now. Um, but I definitely think I'm still learning a lot. I'm too young <laughs> to kind of impart wisdom. <laughs> so I think the first thing is like first surrounding, if I think I'm a mentor, surrounding myself with mentors. And that's been very important since the beginning. Uh, it started out with my parents. My parents built me as a character and I was able to kind of attract more people that I look up to similarly and just keep surrounding myself with people I can learn from. And then from there, kind of, if I want to mentor someone, even at an early stage, maybe it's about connecting them to my mentors. It's not necessarily just me. Because uh, I definitely think building a company, uh, social impact and otherwise, uh, you need diverse opinions. It's going to be such a personal experience that you need to hear from so many people before you find yourself. Great, thank you. And Farah, do you wanna go next? Be happy to. Um, first of all, Asir, I wanna disagree with you that you are not too young to be a mentor. Nobody's ever too young to be a mentor. And I used to think the same thing. And I used to think that 
oh, I don't really have any wisdom to, to give anybody because I haven't you know, done X, Y, Z yet in my career. And that doesn't matter because there's always somebody younger than you. There's always somebody who you know, is on a different path than you and can use your, your wisdom, your help, your advice. Um, so I would encourage you and me and everybody here to reach out to people who are younger than us or earlier in their careers than us and, and help them. Um, so I, I have to say that relationships are everything and I really credit any success in my life to the mentors who helped me along the way. Um, and people who don't look like us or aren't part of our networks, and we feel at a loss as to how to even reach out to us or get connected to us. And so I think our job is to, to do the actual reaching out um, rather than leaving it on them. And so um, I, at the beginning of coronavirus, um, I actually posted on LinkedIn that I was willing to give career advice to anybody who reached out to me. Um, and I think that's a step in the right direction, but even then I think people who are uh, earlier in their careers might feel intimidated or it takes, it takes just a lot of courage to fill, fill out that form and to reach out to somebody, especially when you don't really know what it is that you wanna ask. You know you want mentorship, but you don't exactly know how, uh, you know, what path it is that you wanna take. Um, so I think that one thing that we can do to make it easier for, for people that we would mentor is to show them that we're humans, you know, show them that we're like them and that while we may have experiences or resumes or educations that look impressive, there was a lot of hard work, a lot of rejection, a lot of perseverance. Like I can't even, uh, I've lost count of the number of times I've heard the word no. <laughs> and I think with the, the women on this panel I know have also struggled a lot and faced a lot of rejection and, and it's not easy, but I think what's important is to show that we, were all, we are all humans and that we've all gone through it. And so I think showing the real stuff, um, showing people the imposter syndrome and the doubts and the fears that alone is mentorship because it shows others that they can they can do it too, even if they are feeling all of those things. Thank you, Farah. Runit, what do you think? So I'm obsessed with this issue and this question. So I, I've been I spent two years just digging in the data on mentorship before launching Localized, and uh, so I have a couple of uh, a slightly different way to think about it. Um, I I don't think we necessarily have to think about it as mentors. Um, Internally, we have jargon at Localize that you would never see on our website, but this idea of proximate role models, this idea that there's somebody that if they could do it, then it's possible that maybe you can too, right? And we all need proximate role models. It's not enough that someone out there did something if they're so far from your experience that you can't even allow yourself to imagine that that could be you. You need someone close enough, like where they're reaching, but but you could potentially put yourself in those shoes. And uh, we have one of our experts on Localized who, he's originally Jordanian, he's in charge of product marketing for Google. And he said the only reason in, he's in his job today is because a Microsoft employee talked to his class for an hour when he was a senior, but that employee was Jordanian. And it just blew open his world. So I think that sometimes it's not actually about meeting somebody once a week or once a month or every quarter. Um, I find that we actually need people in moments, there, that people come in in particular moments with particular amounts of information. And that actually the best strategy now is to have as many people as possible that you can turn to for those different moments. And I think the difficulty historically has been that those who ha are in elite circles and have access have incredible social capital. So they have they have the, the pick of anyone to be their mentors. If you go to a fancy school, you're in a fancy network, you're particularly elite in a given uh, country or political circle. At Localize, we're really obsessed with the idea of leveling the playing field for social capital. So that, and so one of the reasons we designed uh, our platform in a one-to-many model. So the expert shares their insights because chances are like Farah's experience is applicable to hundreds of people who can learn from it, not just one. And what we found is that while it's a little bit less gratifying to the expert, because you don't have that one-on-one -on -one emotional connection and you don't necessarily know, is this landing for someone or is it not? And we're gonna have to keep optimizing that. When we look at the data, we find that our users are keep, they keep coming back and keep coming back and they're consuming that content. And what we've also found is that the more junior you are in your journey, like if you're in, in uh, usually in university, you don't necessarily have those questions formulated yet. You don't know what to ask. The questions generally tend to formulate the more specific as you make choices and narrow, you have more narrow and specific questions that you can ask. 
And that sometimes in the early stages, just to be there or to show up or to share your story or how you got there, the challenges you faced, the things that Farah mentioned earlier. Um, and so Asil, like I think you're an incredible role model, right? Like it's, it's I'm, I'm gonna call you about coming to localize at some point. Um, uh, so I think just knowing you exist, Asil, right? Like that in the beginning is a lot. And then over time, then there are the women entrepreneurs who want to work in the health tech space that want to talk to you specifically, right? Like the more, the more that they get further along in their journey, the more specific those questions get. And then it makes sense to be one-on-one. -on -one. So I'm a big believer in actually one-to-many in the earlier stages so that people have as much exposure as they possibly can and then narrow it as it becomes relevant later. And so we're still tweaking that experience. We haven't arrived yet, but that's some of the philosophy that undergirds our approach. That's wonderful. And I, I could not agree more. I mean, personally, I would not have even considered applying to schools in the US had I not seen someone who is not very similar, but at least looks like me who made it. And that just at least, um, implants the idea that maybe I could do it too. And you're absolutely right. Amali, what are your thoughts on this? I, I spent a lot of time seeking out my own mentors and trying to find that wisdom from people in my career. So I definitely relate to this question and, and can uh, um, identify with people who are asking how to how to find mentors and how to have to make the best of them. I think to, to echo Renee's point, I think that the, the first step is not even the act of mentoring, it's the awareness and you can't be what you can't see. And if every, you know, if you want to be in, well, you might not even think that being a startup founder is for you if all you see is white male founders. So the first step is really to just make yourself, put yourself out there. And I'm actually, I'm not a person that's typically comfortable talking about myself or, you know, sort of uh, branding yourself, so to speak. But I think it, the, the older I get and the more I go through my own career, the more I realize how important it is to tell your story in its full detail, and it's in uh, it's it's probably a messy one. And I think kind of said, um, be honest, like be honest about your rejections. I tell people all the time, I'm not ashamed of it. I've been a rejected for jobs that I eventually got. I each other and stop trying to hide behind a facade of like a perfect LinkedIn career path. The the more that we'll achieve as a community, and the more that we'll be able to give people that boost that they need, because otherwise we're just creating this unachievable goal that no one will ever meet unless they meet the, the identical standards of um, the people that are already in power and already in the elite circle. So that's my personal opinion. And I think I think the act of even just being here today and saying that is something that I feel very passionate about. Um, and knowing that, you know, not preaching to the choir, to, to seek out, it is an act, it is a constant act to seek out those communities, to identify uh, them and to be proximate with them. and. And nobody wants to hear from somebody, well, this is my opinion, but nobody wants to hear from somebody that they can't identify with. So find people that um, you know would identify with you and they're more likely to listen to you and you're more likely to have more of an impact. So I think whether that's sharing uh, mentorship with women or sharing people from with, sharing mentorship with people from your background, um, that's important. Not to say that it can't work in other ways, but I think that personally speaking, if somebody from a completely different socioeconomic status or racial background or of a, a man were to give me advice, I'm, I am going to take wisdom from it, but it's going to be in a different, um, in a different way. And I think that's just the human experience. Um, second, I think that it's, it's important to not view mentorship as a, an event and that you're going to have this coffee that's going to change your life. And I think for a long time, I thought that I was just not meeting the right people. And that was why I wasn't finding a good mentor. I wasn't making the right decisions. And I think it's important to realize that a really good mentor is actually, it could just be a good friend that is very honest with you and helps you shift perspectives. I mean, Farah Khan's call is one of, I consider a mentor. She's given me different uh, ideas, different food for thought, different ways of looking at things. So um, broaden your idea of what a mentor is and uh, reach out to people of different backgrounds and people can can give you perspectives that you never thought of, and that is mentorship. And there's a great book by Russell Brand on mentorship, which I love, so I'd recommend that. Thank you, Amali. And that's a perfect segue to my next question, which is, I mean, Farah is my mentor too, and she knows how much <laughs> I appreciate her help. Farah, I know you've, you've been thinking about this a lot, and as a Palestinian-American, how do you stay true to your identity when you're in corporate America, when everyone around you is white and different? That's a good question um, and one that I wasn't expecting. Um, 
first, I want to say, I want to go back to the mentorship thing. And I want to say that I also consider both of you my mentors. So I think that even uh, touches on Emily's point even more about like change your idea of what a mentor looks like. They don't have to be somebody who is, you know, X years older than you or, or so much farther in their career. Um, you can get mentorship and you can get wisdom from people who are younger than you or earlier in your career, et cetera. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Um, in terms of staying true to your identity, I think that there are so many different ways to do this and it's different for everybody. Um, I think that, you know, one thing that I do is I always introduce myself as Farah. I don't Americanize my name in any way and people struggle with it and I've just accepted it and that's just what it's gonna be and that's okay. Um, and that's my, one of my small ways of doing that. Um, I think that there are other ways um, and, and no matter what, when you're staying true to your identity, there will be people who don't like it, unfortunately. I think that's the, the sad truth, um, but I'm fortunate enough to have reached a place in my career where I just don't wanna work with somebody who doesn't like me because I'm Palestinian, you know, and that's fine. There are plenty of other people out there. So I think what's important is that we, we surround ourselves with people who have similar values to us. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean they have the same identity as us. It means they have the same values as us and that we all rise together and help each other, mentor each other, help each other grow. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing. I think um, even then there's just, there are so many issues out there in the world. And I think that seeing the Black Lives Matter movement right now shows you that no matter how hard uh, you try to, to play within the lines, let's say, um, there will always be structural racism and there will always be discrimination. Um, and the Black Lives Matter movement is doing a really phenomenal job of no longer taking it, you know, and to to mobilize everybody and say that we we want a different world and we're going to change the world. And I think we're, we can all do that in different ways, however possible, whether it's introducing yourself as Farah or whether it's taking to the streets. Great. Thank you, Farah. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, my last question, but I, I know that many people in the audience are young people. They're thinking about next career steps. I know mentorship has been mentioned a lot, but People are like grappling with how do I make the right, how do I make an impact, but how do I make money? And what questions should I ask? What parting advice, words of wisdom would you give to a young person in the audience? Um, yeah, I'd love to hear what you all think. And maybe we can start with the Renit. Sure. Um, so, and one thing I'll just add on the mentorship front, just because I think it's important is that, is that um, hold the door open Right. So it's like it's certainly it's helpful to contribute to people who are from your community. But sometimes your community might be the dominant community or the community that keeps helping it itself at the, you know, at the exclusion of other communities. So I, so so just this I, I know it may go without saying, but I, just to be clear about it is this idea that hold the door open. So because there are other uh, individuals and communities that may not have access. And, and so making sure that that door keeps opening. We see that a lot with mentors on localized. They might join to help Tunisians or Indians, but they're delighted when students in Mexico are, are benefiting. It's like, it, there's a lot of generosity. So that idea of, of generosity. Um, I think on the, how do you, how do you make money and how do you sustain yourself? It's a really, it's a real question, right? So for people who don't come from resources, if you don't have a cushion, it's not so easy to just say, oh, just follow your heart and this is doable. I do think that it does come back to having as many proximate examples or role models as possible because the more you are interacting with different kinds of people who are manifesting um, careers that have both impact and can be sustainable, the more options you have. Usually we're, we're limited by our imaginations in terms of what's possible. So for example, I grew up in Quebec during a very deep recession over a decade where um, you didn't ask questions. You could have a PhD, but you were a waiter a waitress. You, you just took whatever job you could get at that period of time. I ended up leaving and coming to the States and realizing I'd internalized that recession mentality, that I was, I had sort of internalized that idea that you just don't ask questions, just take what you can get and be satisfied. And that it took a while to undo that by seeing other people who actually stopped to say and bothered to say, wait a minute, I can negotiate, I can ask for more, I can ask myself what I want, I can combine sports and tech, I can combine uh, human rights and filmmaking, right? Like all of these things can go together. So the more examples you have of that, and that's a lot of what we're trying to do on, on Localized every day, but, but I believe in general, these are the kinds of things I think I wish I had uh, when I was a student. And, and so I just really encourage people, find those examples. You don't even have to speak to them. You don't have to, you just have to know 
um, like when I started my career, I wanted to combine human rights and documentary filmmaking. And at the time, everyone laughed at me, except one person who said, actually, have you heard about the human rights organization Witness? And that changed my life, like that one example. And so find as many of those as possible so that you can open your horizons. Thank you, Renee. Uh, Amali Farah Nasir. Yeah, I think I had I had great advice when I was um, I think about a year out of college from a former manager, and I was I was kind of fixated. I'm sort of a perfectionist, or I'm trying to get rid of that because I don't think it's a good <laughs> trait. Um, but I I was fixated on like, okay, what's the right choice? What is the like? There has to be the own like this this uh, there's only one one door to go through. And uh, she she told me she was like, your career is the jungle gym. It's not a ladder. Like have fun first and foremost what you're doing and don't be so fixated on a sequential path that you think that needs to be followed and i think this is so important because the most interesting people that i know um come from backgrounds where they have seemingly disconnected experiences and they fuse those so just to what ronit was talking about and i think the more um our world is changing and we can't we don't know what we don't know we don't know what the world will look like in five years um and the more that you can weave these things together and create a background that is a, and a career that is suited to you and that is your niche, um, I think the more you'll be able to future-proof your own career. Um, and so just from a like sustainability standpoint, it doesn't make sense to follow a certain path because uh, that, that works for a certain span of time in a certain type of world. And our world is constantly evolving and we don't know, we don't know what's next. Uh, hopefully 2020 will just give us a breather for now, but you know, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And I think, um, like reinvent, be it, we were talking about innovation and, and invention and startups and things like that and practice that on your own life. So practice that on your own career and rapidly prototype your own career. Try to do things that are low, um, uh, they're low commitment, but that will tell you what you would be interested in. So maybe it's a side project. Maybe you do a pro bono project. Maybe you, um, uh, take a take a quick online course just test things because I've often found that I thought I would like something because it was written on paper and I thought hmm that's interesting and then I did it and I hated it just to be quite frank so it's better to not take that job and to instead test it on the side and find out what works for you and just as a note of practical advice um, I think that for me I was very interested in working in, in, in the area of social impact broadly speaking and I didn't really think about what I wanted my day-to-day -day look to look like and I think once I think we can often get fixated on careers as an industry, and instead of looking at the actual micro, like the micro level of what you're doing in your career on a day-to-day -day level, because really we live hour by hour. So look at what you actually like to do. Do you like to talk to people a lot? Do you like to be at your desk all day? Do you like to be out? Do you, you know, these kind of simple questions, but I find them to be useful in helping to evaluate what is the right um, components of your job and then add the layer of industry because I was working in a corporate accelerator, for example, and I I actually really enjoyed the work of working with entrepreneurs and working to help develop business models and help startups find investment. I love that. I didn't love the industry of, of corporate uh, within a corporate setting, but I just shifted it. Once I had developed the, that expertise, I shifted it into a social impact setting. And now I, I do the same exact thing, but within international development. So I think that that, that would have helped me <laughs> A few years ago, so that that would be my words of wisdom. Great, thank you, Molly. We're slightly over time, but I'll Farah uh, very quickly with parting advice. Yeah, I just echo everything that was already mentioned. I, I couldn't agree more with everything that they said, and just to build a little bit on the jungle gym analogy, I completely agree. And my career has definitely been a jungle gym, but even beyond that, I think that when you are in the jungle gym you need to be able to craft your narrative, right? So like explain why you jumped from one thing or another in a way that makes sense. And it always makes sense. If you can craft a narrative, if you can understand why, for example, I went from government into tech, uh, specifically tech policy. And then from there I moved into the product team. And those are things that are some people would say are hard to jump into and hard to make that transition. And it was hard, I faced a ton of rejection. But what I learned along the way was that when I learned how to craft uh, a, and refine a really strong narrative and to explain why government work could make sense in tech and why going from tech policy into tech product also makes sense. When I learned how to do that, doors started to open up for me. So I would say like, don't limit yourself. Don't think that you need to take this linear path, but then also learn how to really describe your nonlinear path in a way that makes sense and is appealing to others. Great. Thank you, Farah. Mm -hmm. Quickly say that 
um, from a different perspective, because everyone's obviously right. You guys are awesome women already. <laughs> so uh, the other side, uh, just on the payment, since that was maybe less discussed. Um, yeah, we, you never know people's situations. You always want to ask what their true worries are, like what's mm -hmm. kind of guiding their current decisions, no matter the age. I don't think it's restricted to kind of being young when you have student debt mm -hmm. versus like when you're older and you have different mortgages or whatever it is. So it's also always about kind of battling your inner demons first to understand w where your drive comes from, because at the end of the day, if you need some compass realignment, then that's where it needs to start. Uh, and before kind of going about like, this is what I want to do. Okay, now I can start to learn myself and be honest with myself and like kind of talk to the people who will truly support me. So I think it, it is somewhat of a inner experience, reflective, everything first. And uh, if it is part of the money, then at the end of the day, if you're going into entrepreneurship, at least, uh, that will always be a worry. So you can't start off that way. <laughs> like, that, like that's just going to kill you. <laughs> but I think there's other ways to kind of like just have faith, surround yourself with supporters. Again, you don't want bad vibes. So there are ways to go about thinking of it differently. Um, but I can understand why that could be a worry. Thank you, Lucille. Well, thank you all so much. This has been, for me, a fascinating conversation. I personally learned so much. Thank you so much to the audience, to the conference organizers for putting all of this together. And thank you so much to our audience for tuning in today. Um, I hope you all found it beneficial. I've been reading some of the comments and um, it sounds like people are really learning a lot from all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.